and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Anna Lukina, a graduate student at Harvard Law School. We will discuss her draft article, Opening the Pandora's Box, Kelson and the Communist Theory of Law. So welcome to the show, Anna. Uh, thank you for having me here. <laughs> no, it's really, it's a pleasure for me. Um, I really enjoyed reading this paper uh, a few weeks ago, uh, especially because I really didn't know anything about the communist theory of law or theories of, of law. For, so for listeners who might be in the same boat as me, I wonder if you could just start by giving a really brief, like high level overview of what we're talking about when we talk about a communist theory of law. Um, I would say that in the context of my paper, I'm talking mo mostly of the communist theories of law that Kelsen identified, and these were the theories that were contemporary to him or came before him. So, of course, our range here is very limited, and it might not cover some of the modern ones, but um, uh, he, uh, Kelsen, he starts with uh, um, the original theory of law, uh, as put forward by uh, Marx and Engels. And then he moves on to um, early Soviet legal scholars. Uh, he firstly moves on to Lenin and his writings on the law and revolution. And uh, then he moves on to 1920s legal scholars such as uh, Stuchka and Pashokanis. And then he moves on to the 1930s and he's talking about Andrei Vashinsky. And then he moves uh, on to some uh, of the communist theories of international law, although I'm not addressing them in my paper. Well, so are there like particular like defining characteristics that are common to the theories of communist law that Kelson is talking about? I mean, is there like any sort of like kind of unifying theme among all those different features that kind of make these theories communist theories of law? So all these theories, they um, kind of can be traced back uh, to uh, writings of Marx and Engels, so they're all uh, based on the perception of law as an instrument of class domination. Uh, however, uh, they kind of unpack these ideas in different ways, uh, and very broadly, uh, two kinds of communist theories of law that I identified in my paper. So one of those um, is what I call... Uh, uh, backward looking theories that kind of rationalize the use of law in uh, um, the uh, regimes of class domination in the past. So, for example, in uh, capitalism, um, uh, law was, according to Marx and Engels, used um, in order to uh, uh, establish and justify and conceal domination. Uh, of the proletariat by the bourgeoisie. Um, and uh, this view sees law as um, an instrument of class domination that will disappear um, after the transition to communism, after the proletarian revolution. However, there is another view uh, that was developed later on um, as uh, uh, kind of more need has appeared for uh, legal instruments and legal structures uh, throughout uh, the development of the Soviet Union as uh, law was seen as necessary for domination and therefore the role of law had to be um, re-rationalized and this kind of theory which I call forward-looking theory sees uh, a place for law even in um, a socialist society um, that is on its way to transitioning to communism. And um, while it still sees law as temporary and disappearing under communism, it seems um, to perceive it as um, an indispensable arrangement that is necessary uh, for this transition and uh, that is necessary for actually achieving the goals of the communist revolution. Well, so in, in your paper, you observe that the legal theorist uh, Hans Kelsen used the 
various communist theories of law to illustrate what you refer to as his Pandora's box objection to to natural law. So uh, two two questions I think immediately spring to mind. I mean, first off, I wonder if you can explain what Kelson and you know, rather what what you're referring to when you talk about this Pandora's box exception, and also subsidiarily, like why this comparison of communist theories of law to national uh, to natural law theory? Because it's not an obvious comparison, and I, f- I found that really interesting. Um, so one way I would put forward the Pandora's box objection would be to say that uh, in the Pandora's box objection, Kelsen claims that uh, the mode of analysis employed in natural law theory uh, is actually not going to improve the moral content of law, as it is often claimed uh, by those uh, who uh, advocate for these theories, uh, as opposed to positivism, which doesn't really discriminate um, against uh, bad or evil or moral laws based on their content. He's saying that it is the other way around. Um, he is saying that this mode of analysis uh, doesn't um, prevent um, unjust laws from happening, but it apologizes for this unjust laws. And he is basing it on um, uh, his conviction that there's no such thing as objective morality and what we refer to as natural law is actually our or our own projection of what a uh, law should be. And therefore, it is possible to kind of retroactively rationalize any positive law if uh, this natural law slot is open, basically. And uh, uh, I hope it's clear. Um, and um, he, uh, because he is considering uh, not normal contexts in which natural law theories are deployed, by, but contexts in which natural law theories are, I would say, misused, although he probably wouldn't say that it's a misapplication. Uh, it seems very evident and very clear to him to uh, look into uh, the communist um, theory of law as kind of somewhat an unlikely expression of uh, natural law method. So in fact, the fact that um, the communist theory of law is uh, very unusual from a natural law perspective is helping to illustrate Kelsen's thesis as um, Mm -hmm. it um, basically showcases a previously unseen side to natural law theories. Mm -hmm. Well, so if I may, then, it seems like Kelsen's objection to natural law theory is essentially to point out that natural law theory seems to claim the ability to constrain the law in some way and make it consistent with morality. And his, as I take it from your, from your article, essentially his counter argument is that, well, no, actually natural law theory essentially can just justify any law, no matter how immoral, and therefore it's not actually doing the work it claims to do. Is is that right? Yeah, this is correct. Mm-hmm. Well, so, so how does that work in relation to the communist theory of law then? Because I wouldn't normally think of a communist theory of law as being uh, a natural law theory at all, but it seems like at, at least in some respect, there's like at least arguably a deep commonality between at least some communist theories of law and the natural law theory? Uh, Yes, I would say that the natural law model definitely doesn't describe uh, the backward-looking communist theories of law um, as uh, the backward-looking communist theories of law do not seek to justify the law. On the contrary, they discard law uh, as... um, an instrument of domination, of oppression, of 
um, somewhat um, obfuscation of uh, actual reality. And uh, they seek to dispense the flow um, on the road to um, a new um, mode of social order. Uh, however, uh, with regards to the forward-looking theories of law, um, the legal instrument um, is justified as uh, it is seen as necessary for the promotion of uh, the goals of socialism, the goals of socialism, uh, and um, uh, the ends of the revolution. Uh, so, uh, in this sense, uh, like in any classic natural law theory, according to Kelsen's description, um, a communist theory of law uh, is justifying any content of this law um, with reference to uh, a certain kind of uh, moral ideal, if they don't themselves describe it as moral and claim that it's actually uh, what the history demands. Mm. So, so, so then, if I may, it seems like the reason the Pandora's box objection you describe doesn't necessarily apply to the backward looking theories is that it seems like those communist theories of law kind of reject the entire idea of there being any law in the first place. I wouldn't say that they reject an idea of being law, but they definitely see law as impossible and undesirable under communism. And uh, while they say that the law exists, they explicitly reject the conviction of um, many natural lawyers that uh, law in itself is just and is based on any kind of moral truth. Those communist legal theories that, uh, on the other hand, recognize uh, a possibility of law under communism um, actually see that there is such a kind of law that can be reconciled with uh, social reality and what the history demands or what is proper and what is just uh, under the communist ideal. Mm. Well, so for the backward looking theories of, of communist theory of law, I mean, how do they envision society being governed under communism? I mean, I mean, is there some alternative that they have or sort of what's the vision of sort of how things will be ordered? Or is the kind of the presumption just that once you have communism, you won't need any kind of social ordering anymore? This is uh, a very interesting question that, that I'm uh, exploring in my current research. And the answer to this question is that uh, they formally disclaim law, but they still envision certain systems of norms. So, for example, Pashukhanis referred to technical rules that uh, would govern the society um, after communism. And while these rules are not legal rules, it's very hard to see how... Uh, very different from legal norms. And probably it's because to Pashukhanis and theorists like him, law is only um, a system of rules that has class character. And thus, since these technical rules don't have a class character, they're not seen as law. Mm, mm. Well, you know, I, I have to say, it struck me reading your paper that you make a distinction early on between um, kind of revolutionary and conservative natural law theories. And in a way, that distinction at least kind of seems to map onto the distinction between backward and forward looking theories, at least roughly, I'm thinking, in the sense that it seems like the backward looking theories are kind of anyway saying that well, under communism, there's going to be something totally different that will reflect sort of like the underlying nature of society that really is true and morally good, as opposed to some existing order that's not consistent with the way things should be. Is that even close? I would say that there is this kind of connection. The reason why 
I'm using kind of different uh, points of reference and different classification than conservative and revolutionary natural law theories is that, of course, we're natural law theories uh, beside communist theories of law. And there are a lot of revolutionary theories that would uh, recognize new forms of law and new legal orders. So, for example, when we look at the French Revolution, uh, the demand was not to dispense with the legal form as such, but to bring about new rules that uh, were more equitable. And uh, this, in my opinion, differs from the backward looking communist theory in that it doesn't um dispense with the law as a whole mm, mm. well so uh, how did natural law theorists respond to kelson's critique and to his pandora's box objection i mean is there a way that they can counter that objection well i think the obvious way to counter this objection is to uh, is to argue that there are indeed some objective truths and some objective moral ideals, because of course, Kelsen's skepticism of natural law theory comes from uh, certain uh, uh, skepticism about um, objective morality. And uh, I think this is clearly the main way in which Kelsen and uh, natural lawyers diverge. I don't really delve into this question in my paper um, because it's, again, it's, an additional, very complicated, very researched uh, problem. A lot has been written on it, and it's still one of those fundamental, unresolved philosophical questions. Uh, but um, what I'm trying to do is uh, to see how um, the objection works on Kelsen's own terms and presumption, and what it is, and what uh, is it internal logic. Well, so, so how would that work? I mean, you, you, you do talk about John Finnis's objection to Kelsen's, uh, Kelsen's criticism of, of natural law. C could, could, could you go into that objection a little bit and whether or not it's an objection that's available to communist theories of law to also counter Kelsen's objection? Uh, yes, of course. Um, Finnis's objection to Calvin's theory is that this theory uh, misconstrues the nature of natural law theories in that Calvin believes, according to Finnis, that uh, uh, natural law um, kind of presupposes that positive law is an exact copy of natural law ideals, while um, on Finnis's view, um, natural law theories do not really kind of map a clear and exact connection in terms of um, uh, positive law being an exact copy of natural law. Positive law is, of course, based on natural law's ideals, but uh, these ideals are realized in the form of delegation. So natural law describes general principles while positive law builds upon those principles and puts them into practical application. Uh, however, I would argue that even if this objection is true, it doesn't really alter uh, the Pandora's box argument since uh, there's still a nexus between natural law and positive law. And there's still um, a certain... Um, restrained on positive law that is claimed by natural lawyers, uh, even if they don't perceive positive law as an exact copy of natural law. Um, if um, there is a relationship of uh, delegation or determination, uh, then uh, the content of positive law still depends uh, on the content of natural law, and it can't go beyond it, although it can particularize it in many different ways. So I wouldn't say that uh, this uh, observation, while of course very important, really affects uh, the nature of Kelsen's argument uh, with regards to uh, the Pandora's box objection. Mm. Well, so is this a response that the communist theories of law can use, or do the way that they themselves structure their 
conception of law make it difficult for them to respond in the same kind of way as someone like Finnis? I would say that uh, with regards to this question, communist theories of law would work exactly the same. Uh, but, uh, they themselves are not uh, built uh, on kind of very specific um, instructions that were natural law or uh, their ideals of uh, communism, ideals of equity, demands of history, whatever you call it, has. Uh, they still recognize some creative freedom and bringing these ideals into real life. Uh, and therefore, I would say uh, the Pandora's box objection is still the same. What I wouldn't say is the same is the other dimension of uh, Penis's observation and Penis's link to uh, St. Thomas Aquinas that I uh, also mentioned in my paper. And that is uh, a possible way to refute or to mitigate uh, the Pandora's box objection uh, by referring to the rule of law ideal. Mm, well, so how would that work? I mean, is there such a thing or such a concept as the rule of law in a communist theory of law? Because it seems like, at least in some ways, that might be kind of antithetical to some of the fundamental premises of the communist theories of law you describe. Um, what I say in my paper is that there's no such concept recognized um, in communist uh, law. Uh, and uh, kind of the concept which is closely parallel to it is socialist legality, but it is much less restrictive and much more expansive. And I think that uh, in terms of uh, communist law, um, ideas such as, um, uh, for instance, legal certainty or clarity or non-retroactivity, etc., uh, weren't followed as closely as they would be followed under a normal rule of law conception. Uh, however, in my recent work, um, I'm delving uh, into this question uh, more closely, and perhaps uh, I would say that some of my generalizations do not really apply to the ins and outs of uh, the Soviet view um, of... Um, the rule of law. However, for the purposes of a Pandora's box objection, I think there's still, even on this general level, a strong argument uh, that um, communist uh, theories of law um, are not as constrained by the rule of law ideal uh, as other theories of natural law might be. Mm -hmm. Well, so, so Anna, I, I wonder if you could also reflect a little bit on what this paper and uh, Kelsen's work on communist theories of law can tell us more broadly about the you know debate, as it were, between positive and and natural law theories that's sort of like looming in the paper. I mean, as you point out in in your article. Um, this is one of Kelson's lesser known works. And I, I thought it was a really kind of interesting dissection of his argument and its application in this particular context. D do you think it kind of helps us reflect more broadly on Kelson's larger project? I think it does. And I think one of uh, the projects that I pursue in my work more generally is to look at arguments and look at examples that are often neglected and that are often less available. Uh, so for instance, I see that uh, mostly in main discourse about the nature of law and um, the mainstream examination of jurisprudential problems, we look at legal systems that um, are familiar liberal democracies. Uh, we look at um, Anglo-American legal systems, sometimes look at uh, continental legal systems from Western Europe, but we don't really look uh, at um, examples of, for example, authoritarian uh, and totalitarian regimes uh, throughout history and even now, uh, which I think means that a lot of current arguments and a lot of current debates 
miss certain sides to law uh, that are not um, readily evident or apparent when uh, we look mostly at uh, the US experience or the UK experience. So I think reflecting on uh, the nature of communist theory of law and its connection to um, natural law and the natural law positivism debate is uh, definitely a worthwhile enterprise. Mm. Well, so in closing, Anna, I wonder if you could kind of talk about what you're working on next, because I, I know you have a much kind of longer set of projects in this area. And I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about kind of where you're going to be taking these ideas in the future. So my current project I referenced in this podcast uh, is uh, my work in progress, which focuses on the nature of of a dictatorship of a proletariat um, in Soviet legal theory and in Marxist legal theory as well. And I look into this question uh, from uh, the perspective of Carl Schmitt's concept of uh, dictatorship um, and uh, his concept of sovereign dictatorship more generally. And I looked at the ways um, in which Marx and Engels and subsequently uh, Soviet legal theorists understand uh, the revolutionary situation and the way in which uh, they recognize the importance of law. Uh, and uh, I think the result is quite striking that we didn't really envision, even with some earlier theorists, a purely extra-legal tradition. And they recognized the importance of either preserving some legal tools from the empire or uh, building new legal tools uh, in the new socialist system. Uh, so uh, one can say that law plays a much uh, larger role even uh, in regimes such as uh, Soviet Union and uh, the transitionally revolutionary regime before that. Uh, and uh, this signifies the importance of law even when a reasonable observer would probably describe the situation as lawless. Well, Anna, thanks so much for coming on the program. Uh, I learned a ton about a legal regime I honestly had known nothing previously about, both by reading your paper and by talking to you about it. And I hope listeners enjoy this as much as I did. Thank you so much. Thank you.